Hello and welcome back to another edition of Synapse Brain and Spine Foundation. Today's video is on 10 things you always wanted to know about the human spine. Number 1. The spine is made up of the bones of the spine called the vertebrae. This forms the spinal column or the vertebral column. This contains the spinal cord within which is an extension of the brain and which has nerve roots coming out which supply the upper body, the upper limb, the chest, the abdomen and the lower legs. They are 33 in number and named by called by different names based on where they are found. The primary function of the spine is to protect and support the spinal cord and the nerves inside. It also gives attachment to the muscles, tendons and ligaments. It connects the upper body with the lower body and sort of balances the weight of the entire body. The 33 bones of the spine are divided into the cervical when they are found in the neck, thoracic when they are found in the chest, lumbar where they are found in the lower part of the back, sacral when they are found as part of the pelvic bone system and coccygeal which is a part of the tailbone. Number two, what are intervertebral discs? We just learned that there are bones in the spinal column. Now these bones are separated from each other as seen in this representation by red cushions. These cushions between the bones of the spinal column act like shock absorbers and are called the intervertebral discs. Because it has a shape like a disc and is present between two vertebrae, it is called intervertebral disc. Each disc has two parts, an outer ring and an inner jelly-like structure. The outer ring is called the annulus fibrosus. The inner jelly-like structure is the nucleus pulposus. If we take a closer look at how the disc looks, the annulus fibrosus is the outer ring and is made up of a fibrous material. Annulus means ring, fibrosus means because it is made up of a fibrous material. Nucleus pulposus is the inner jelly that this ring contains. And it has a jelly-like material, so it is called pulposus. Nucleus means in the center. This is another diagrammatic representation of the same intervertebral disc. Number three. Very often I am asked by patients in the clinic as to what is the meaning of these different terms, degenerated disc, thinned disc, what is a disc bulge, how is that different from a prolapsed disc and what is the meaning of a pinched nerve. Let us examine what ha exactly happens to the disc and we will see what these terms mean. A degenerated disc is simply what its name suggests. There is a degeneration of the intervertebral disc over a period of time. So it is more common in the elderly population. However, with increased wear and tear or repetitive movements which cause high impact on the disc can also lead to disc degeneration. In this diagrammatic representation, you can see that there is a small grayish structure which is seen within the blue disc and this grayish is actually the degeneration and small tears that are occurring in the annulus fibrosus. When this continues for a long period of time, the body has its own natural mechanism to try and compensate and to maintain stability and the bone starts increasing in size and there is calcium deposition. This is called osteophyte formation. If this continues for some more time, the height of the 
intervertebral disc reduces and leads to a thinning of the disc. This is called a thinned disc. A further progression of the tear in the annulus fibrosis, even if it is small, can lead to a small extrusion of the nucleus pulposus from within and cause a small bulge of the annulus fibrosis into the spinal canal. This bulge by itself is not harmful and may not lead to any symptoms. This is a bulging disc. This can also be seen quite commonly in many MRIs even when patients do not have any symptoms. Normally, we do not need to address bulging discs. However, if the tear continues and becomes complete and the nucleus pulposus actually extrudes itself out into the spinal canal, that means it herniates itself, this leads to a herniated disc. So, re to reiterate what we learnt just now, a degenerated disc is a normal aging process and with age, the disc becomes less flexible, it has less shock absorbing capacity and can lead to tears in the outer ring and this tear can help the nucleus pulposus to come outside of its normal place and herniate itself out depending on where the tear has occurred and where the pulposus has actually extruded itself out the herniated disc can cause different kinds of symptoms if it abuts against a nerve root it can lead to a nerve root compression if it abuts against one the spinal cord itself at one or more places it can lead to canal stenosis we will know more about this in the later part of the video continue to watch it again this is a diagrammatic representation to help understand what exactly has happened to the intervertebral disc over a period of time If the intervertebral disc which has herniated goes and compresses a nerve root which is exiting from the spinal cord, then this nerve root can get pinched between the bone which is outside and the bone on the other side. So the nerve root gets caught between two kinds of bones and is being compressed by the herniated disc. This leads to a pinched nerve and can lead to pain along the nerve root distribution. Now we are going to see how a prolapsed cervical disc can cause nerve pinching. We just learnt how herniated disc occurs. And if this occurs in the cervical spine, that is in the neck area, and causes compression on the exiting nerve root, it can cause cervical radiculopathy. This is in the lumbar area. The first picture shows a prolapsed disc which was seen on the MRI before operation. During operation, this is the huge disc which was prolapsed, which was removed. And post-operatively, an MRI done showed a normal spine and the prolapsed disc being removed after the operation. Point number four. What is spinal canal stenosis? It is just a narrowing of the central area of the spinal column where the spinal cord and or the nerves are situated. The spinal canal stenosis could be caused by congenital, that is reasons because of birth, or 
single or multiple disc prolapses or any other lesion which intrudes into the space meant for the spinal cord to be occupied. Most commonly it is seen in the cervical and lumbar areas but occasionally it can also be seen in the thoracic area. If it is seen in the cervical it is called cervical canal stenosis. If it is in the lumbar it is called lumbar canal stenosis. This is a picture on the right hand side which shows severe lumbar canal stenosis caused by herniated discs. This MRI shows cervical canal stenosis occurring at multiple places and causing compression of the spinal cord. Number five, what is spondylosis? Spondylosis is a simple term which means arthritis of the spinal bones and can occur at any level. It may be asymptomatic and generally does not need any kind of treatment. Number six, what is spondylolysis? It is a stress fracture through one of the small areas of the vertebral column or one vertebral body. The natural curvature of the lumbar spine makes it more prone to undergo stress. Sports like football, gymnastics and athletics predispose to spondylolysis at a younger age. This condition is fairly common but is generally asymptomatic. In some patients, the only symptom may be back pain, which is a niggling kind of pain, but it does not prevent the person from performing his or her daily activities. Rest is the most important treatment apart from analgesics and physiotherapy. Posture correction and muscle strengthening are also advised. In spite of all these measures, if the pain persists, surgery with screw and bone graft fixation may be an option, especially in athletes who wish to pursue their sporting activity. So this is different from spondylosis. Spondylosis is just a regular wear and tear which occurs or arthritis of the spinal column, one of the bones of the spinal column, whereas spondylolysis is a small stress fracture normally not requiring any treatment. Number seven, what is spondylolisthesis? The bone of the spinal column above slips beyond the bone below. This is listhesis. It is most commonly seen in the lumbar area and causes localized pain in the back. This pain can be severe and debilitating, especially when People need to stand for prolonged periods of time. On the left hand side, one can see an x-ray which shows spondylolisthesis. And in the same patient, the MRI also reveals a spondylolisthesis of the fifth lumbar vertebra over the first sacral vertebra or the L5-S1 spondylolisthesis. This generally needs fixation. Number eight, we learned how a disc can herniate. Now, let us see the MRI images of cervical disc herniation, which means that the intervertebral disc between two cervical vertebrae has herniated out and is causing compression either on the spinal cord or on the nerve exiting there. If this occurs in the lumbar area, it is called a lumbar disc herniation. Here one can see that there is one single disc herniation. Number nine, what is radiculopathy? It is the name given to direct pressure or compression on a nerve root which is exiting from the spinal cord. This is commonly caused by herniated disc or occasionally there can be other lesions which are present within the spinal uh, canal. The pain occurs along the root of the nerve that is compressed and is called radiculopathy. Now, depending on whether it is in the cervical or lumbar area, it is called cervical radiculopathy or lumbar radiculopathy. If it occurs along the nerve roots of the sci sciatic nerve, it is called sciatic. Number 10. 
what is myelopathy we saw what radiculopathy is that is pressure on the nerve root myelopathy is the term given to disease of the spinal cord caused by compression of the entire spinal cord that is in that area so the here you can see the mri which shows that there are multiple compressions along multiple levels which are compressing the spinal cord over 3 or 4 or 5 levels this leads to symptoms which are different from that of root compression and this is called myelopathy quite often patients are confused when mri ct and x rays are advised at different times mri gives a very good delineation of certain um, bony structures and very good delineation of lot of soft tissue structures so if we want to examine the disc and nerve root and spinal cord in detail mri is the investigation of choice ct scan is advised when we want to know more about the bony structure of the spinal column for example if there are fractures like in this case a ct scan is an excellent investigation to get very good idea and precise idea about where the fracture is and what kind of fracture it is x rays give us an idea about again about the bony column so it is useful in making out whether the osteophyte formation is there whether the disc space has been narrowed x rays are extremely useful when we have fixed to know what has happened to the implant that we have used for fixation this is a case of spondylolisthesis which has got fixation now this is an x ray of a patient who has had cement injected into the bone which led uh, the fracture was there in this uh, vertebral body and this has been addressed by using a bone cement to prevent collapse of the vertebral body and this has given more body and volume to the vertebra and has helped relieve the patient of her pain so this procedure is called vertebroplasty thank you for listening to us and if you haven't subscribed please do and leave comments in the comment box below so that we'll know what if you need any um, further information on any particular things that are related to the spine we'll be happy to make more videos educational videos so that there is more interaction between the patient and the doctor thank you